Jaden. Thank you so much. Um, are we just going to live with this? All right. I get it. I get it. If you, if, you can, uh, if you can hear, and this is for the young people now, I'd like to have them participate. Now, the, uh, I just want to share, there is a difference between hastening and hurrying, but I'm not going to get into that today. We're just going to use this as the analogy. If you, let's see if you can identify these Bible stories. They came in a hurry and found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby as he lay in a manger. Who was it that hastened to the manger? Who was that? Okay, I see Benji's hand back here. Is that you, Benji? Benji is going to help us out with this question. Oh, the red mic. Are we not? Is the red mic not working? Say it again, Benji. The shepherds. The shepherds. Very good. Now, some of you may have thought the wise men, but uh, Benji corrected us on that. It was the shepherds that hurried and hastened on their way. That was a good thing to hasten to, to uh, hear the angels and to go to see baby Jesus. Another story, when Jesus came to the place, He looked up and said to him, hurry and come down, for today I must stay at your house. I saw Ryden's hand go up. I don't mean to neglect any of my young people over here. I just saw Ryden put his hand up. Who are we talking about here? Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus or Zacchaeus. You guys all remember the song, right? Zacchaeus was a wee little man and a... Of course, now it's Zacchaeus. I guess that's the better way of saying it. Yes, this is the story. Jesus looks up and says, don't delay. You better come on down now. Let's get together. And of course, again, this is a similar story of, uh, of meeting with Jesus. So whenever we have the opportunity to see or meet Jesus, we should hasten. Amen? Love that. Okay, going into the Old Testament, which of the festivals were the Israelites to eat in haste? Was it Passover? Father's Day? Hanukkah or Thanksgiving? I do see Isaiah's hands up. Boy, this side is winning the quiz debate, guys. I don't know if you understand that. Ray, Peter, I see you over there, guys. You could help out. But Isaiah is going to help us here. He is an intelligent young man. That is amazing. Your pastor must really know how to teach you. Of course, it's Passover, and, and, and truly, the Israelites were to re-enact uh, the reality of that moment uh, when, when, when the, the Spirit of, of God went over the Egyptians and passed over those who'd placed the door on their doorposts and opened the way of salvation. They were to eat that meal in haste because at any moment, they were to, they were to leave. And so, every time they were to eat the Passover, it wasn't like Thanksgiving where you sit around the meal and you eat for six hours and then you take a nap and then you eat again the leftovers for four hours, okay? Passover was meant to be eaten in haste because the way of salvation is opening up, and we don't want to be delayed. Eat it in haste. So there's a lot of symbolism. A couple other stories about those who are in haste or hurry. David ran quickly to fight and defeat this giant Philistine. Who are we talking about here? Uh, Jaden, I see Abel's got his hand up here. Abel? David or Goliath? Yeah, it was Goliath, wasn't it? And, and a, an amazing story of David running to the battle line. Uh, this was a young man who really had confidence in God. It's a powerful story. We love it. A lot to be learned from there. Another famous story. King Darius went in haste, the Bible says, to see if he was still in the lion's den. Okay, finally, we're going to get, okay, four points are going to be awarded over here uh, for this final question. That way we'll be even and then it'll be fine. <laughs> All right, come on over here, Jaden. And right here. Uh, Daniel. Daniel, is he right? There's only one who really uh, was in the lion's den. If you remember the story, it was Daniel. Thank you, Jaden. Thank you, Jared, for being such wonderful microphone engineers. You can just sit on the front pew. That's fine. A um, lot of stories about being in haste and in a hurry in the Bible. And sometimes it's negative. Sometimes it's positive. They're not always the same. Well, I want to uh, use an illustration from history as I move into my message. You know that I love history, and sometimes a memory jogs of something that I think really applies well. It's been 110 years since World War I started, and uh, whether we've studied it or not, we still are impacted by the realities of this war. I don't know if you realize that, but m many of the issues that we deal with today can be traced back to World War I, including what's happening in Israel right now. 
Some of those things you can literally trace to some of the geopolitical developments of World War I. It's 107 years, though, since the U.S. officially entered the war. It wouldn't be till April of 1917 that the U.S. would officially become a belligerent nation in World War I. Now, before that, uh, America was really on the fence of, of what to do. Uh, they, were, they wanted to stay out of the war, but they were obviously connected with the world and what was happening, and uh, they were kind of walking the line between supporting the central powers. There were a lot of Germans living in America at this time. As a matter of fact, in 1915, Woodrow Wilson said, we are now closer to Germany right now than we are with England and France. So it was not a foregone conclusion that America was going to enter the war and fight with the British and the Belgians and the Russians and the French. Um, uh, but eventually, as the war developed and some of the things that happened, uh, the U.S. enters the war in April of 1917. So by this time, Europe had been at war for three years, three gruesome, bloody years. Millions had died, and millions more were still in trenches facing each other across no man's land. So then America joins the war. Now, the, the Allies had been hoping for this moment for years, and so the French immediately deployed this gentleman. Now, you probably don't know him. His name is Joseph Jacques Cessier Joffre, and I, I know a lot about him because I've studied a lot about him, but for a long time, this guy was as famous in American households as was other French uh, friends of America like Montesquieu and Lafayette and Rochambeau, uh, Americans fell in love with Joffre. He became a celebrity of, of a type. Um, after the war, he came to America, um, and he was really... His, his, by the way, some of his military strat tactics and strategy are still studied in uh, American uh, military academies. But anyways, I'm digressing. Joffre comes to the United States late of April 1917, and he's going to coordinate with America in entering the war officially as a belligerent. Now, you may not know this, um, but when we declared war on April 4th, 1917, it was unclear, even in America, what that meant. And Americans didn't understand that we were going to be sending soldiers. They thought we were just going to increase, some Americans, some politicians and those in power, they thought we were just going to start sending more supplies, more bullets, more facilities, and things like that. So Joffre, he comes to D.C., and he's in a meeting with the War Cabinet, and one of the ministers of the War Cabinet says, America is prepared to send France more supplies and more facilities now that we're in the war. Joffre jumped up from his seat, nearly knocking his chair over, and in broken English, he did not speak very good English, in very thick uh, French, he said, we need men, men, men. And uh, the uh, senator from Virginia, his name was Thomas Martin, said, you mean you want our soldiers over there? Any of you know anything about World War I? We began to refer to the war as over there. And Joffre was, uh, again, just astounded, and, and, and he made it clear that in order for this war to be won, in order for the Americans to have an influence, they had to get involved. Now, I'm not here to debate the wisdom of this. This was a terrible war. It made no sense. Again, when Wilson uh, ran his re-election uh, campaign in 1915, the main uh, pillar of his campaign was, is I will get the belligerent nations to at least tell us what they're fighting for. Did you know that? During the entire war, none of the nations ever really declared why they were fighting. Germany said, we're defending ourselves. Uh, the Austro-Hungarian prince was assassinated. We're defending ourselves. The Russians said, we're defending ourselves. The Belgians said, we're defending ourselves. The British said, we're defending the Belgians. The French said, we're defending the Russians. Everyone claimed throughout the entire war that they were fighting a defensive war. It was stupid. It was horrible. It was ridiculous. But in order for it to be come to an end, in order for it to uh, reach a conclusion, uh, Joffre made it clear we have to have people fight. It's an analogy, and all analogies have their limitations. But as believers, we know, and you've heard it many times, we're in a war, aren't we? We're in a war. And if we have accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we are not neutral. We're not Switzerland. We're not Ireland. We're not Iceland. <laughs> all neutral nations, by the way, in case you didn't notice. 
we are on the side of one of the uh, participants of this war. As a matter of fact, Revelation describes us this way. This is us, by the way, and we can debate the 144,000 and the meaning of all that, but right after mentioning the 144,000 in the book of Revelation, John says this, after these things I looked and behold, a great multitude, this multitude was vast. No one could count this multitude. They came from every nation, tribe, people, and tongue. They were standing before the throne and before the Lamb. This is God's army. This is God's people. This is God's church. Then see how they're described. They are clothed in white robes. They have palm branches in their hands. They cry with a loud voice saying, salvation to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. In in at least one microcosm of way of looking at it, this is a description of you and I in this war that we are participants in. We are clothed in white robes. That's a reference to the righteousness, not of our own, but of Jesus Christ. The Bible says our righteousness is as filthy rags. They're of no virtue, but when we accept Jesus Christ, He closes us, clothes us with His righteousness and, and imbues us with His faithfulness, okay? The palm branches was always a symbol of peace. Wherever there was palms, there was water, there was life, there was shade, palm branches were always a symbol of peace. So we're clothed with Jesus' righteousness, our weapon is peace, and our message is salvation. This is who we are. This is the path that we are on. And it's not neutral. Simply living a moral life through the power of the Holy Spirit and loving uh, recognition of Jesus Christ is not what we're called for. We are called to be active in the service of God. We need, not men, 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 we need everyone. How many of you are not needed? Raise your hand if you are not needed in God's service right now. Don't raise your hand, please. That was meant to be rhetorical, okay? You are needed. You have a role. God has a plan at every age. There is something for you in the service of God. Now, Peter is where I bring my... um, my main verse from, am I not doing this right? Did it crash? I want to come to Second Peter here, if I may. There we go. So Peter, as he's writing his letters, he's describing, you know, the, the, the last days. He's describing to the church what they should expect in end times. He's referencing both from Old Testament and, and, and uh, the character that should be developed. And he, make, he talks about how the earth is not going to last forever. And then he comes to this verse in, in 2 Peter 3.11. He says, since all these things are going to be destroyed, everything on earth, everything that's around. This is not our eternal home. This place has been cursed by sin. This place is not the eternal destination that God has for us. Okay, and since we know that, he asks this question, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? And by the way, he just leaves it hanging there. And I want you to listen to it. What sort of people should we be in our holy conduct and godliness, knowing that the end is near, knowing that God has a different destination and plan for us, knowing that this war will not go on forever. An end is coming. So, what sort of person should we be? Now, Peter, in both his, his letters, first and second, he goes through a lot of character qualifications, a lot of behavioral and conduct and things that we should appreciate. Um, And we could go throughout all of those. But then he says this, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God. Now, I know many of you have read this before. You may have meditated and thought about the deep meaning and implications of this statement. But if you haven't, it's well worth our our, our attention and our, uh, our focus for just a moment this morning. According to Peter, we as believers, we as the church can alter the timing of the coming of Christ. We can impact it. 
Sometimes in, in Christian circles, uh, the implication or the inference has been drawn that when God comes, it's just kind of some arbitrary date that's just kind of up there in the ethereal uh, 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 heavens, and we just have to wait for it to come. That God has established that date, and when all the conditions are right, uh, you know, it's just going to come, irregardless of who we are, what we do, or what's happening on the earth, it's just going to come. That's not accurate, friends. And it's not just this statement. There's other uh, statements throughout the prophets in the Old Testament that that establishes this reality that God is actually molding and calling His believers and His people to be active participants in shaping the realities of this world to prepare it and to expedite the coming of Christ. We should not be sitting back and just saying, well, it'll come one day. I'm going to make sure I'm ready for it. Peter says, what sort of person ought you to be in conduct and godliness because you can actually help Jesus come sooner? Now, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Our holy conduct, our godliness impacts God's ability to say, now we're ready. Now we can bring this war to an end. All of our our experience changes when we get this into our minds and into our hearts. It alters how we think about our our relationships and our our decisions on a daily basis. Just to, again, sum up, we know that God desires all to be saved. He's not willing that any should perish, all right? Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. We know that, and we know that His desire should be our desire, If we're growing into the likeness of Christ, then we're going to grow into this same reality of passion and love and desire that others would be saved. Amen? Jesus came, I said, I came to seek and to save. I did not come here to be be served. I came to serve. The greatest among you should be your servant. Over and over through his actions and his instructions, Jesus makes it clear. He who hears what I say and does what I say, he says in the Sermon on the Mount. It's like the man who builds his house upon the rock. So we hasten the day of the Lord when we let the Holy Spirit lead us into service in His gospel work. Now, there's a lots of uh, 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 stories and analogies that, that, that help illustrate this, but I just want to go right with what Peter talks about. Peter, in both First and Second Peter, will reference the story of the flood. As a matter of fact, it's Peter who identifies Noah as a preacher of righteousness in Second Peter 2.5. He gives us that identifier. Mark, uh, uh, Dean Mark was talking earlier about all the ways we can identify ourselves. Up until Peter mentions pre- uh, Noah as a preacher of righteousness, a lot of times we just think of him as a carpenter, a builder. But Peter says there was more to the story. He was an active preacher telling that world about the impending destruction and the opportunity for salvation that would be found in the ark. He was a preacher of righteousness. So I want to use, um, oh yeah, before I go there, Uh, This is kind of the reality. If we hasten the day of the Lord by our positive action, isn't it true that we we delay it through our inaction? That's hard. But I want to go to the flood for a minute because Peter uses the flood. and, and, And of course, Jesus himself goes, as it was in the days of Noah, so also shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. So he invites us to evaluate this story and contemplating our story and participation with His calling and His work. And we know the story of the flood well. Noah's called to build this vessel that's going to be an opportunity of salvation. We know that only he and his family are ultimately saved, and we we realize that. But I can imagine, and just go with me for a second, during this process, we know the earth is filled with violence, and it, it pains the heart of God to come to this conclusion, to this moment. But Noah and his sons are tasked. God could have brought a, an ark down and sat it in front of them, couldn't he? He could. You, you don't seem convinced that he could. could. Could God have just said, hey, Noah, by the way, I've built an ark for you. Just go take care of it. And he could certainly have done that. No, he said, you're going to build it. You and your sons and those who are willing, you're going to build it. And it's going to be the vessel of salvation. And while it's being built, you're going to be a preacher of righteousness. You and your family are going to present that this is the way of salvation. But I can imagine that during the building process, and I'm sure it took a long time to build this boat, 
that at some point, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, the, th- the sons of Noah, probably came to him and said, Dad, we got to talk. What is it, sons? Well, you know we've been working on this ark a long time, and we believe in it. We know it's God's plan. He's promised you. We do. We understand. But we would like to take a break. Well, what do you mean by that? Well, you know, we're not going to get involved in the wickedness of the world, Dad. We promise. We're going to keep our morality high. We're not going to do the things that's all. We understand that. But we understand also there's some good stuff in this world still, and we just we want to take a break. Just a couple of decades, Dad. Just two, 20, 30 years. That's all we want. Well, what for? And I can imagine Shem saying, well, I've been hearing about these Egyptians. They're doing something called pyramids. I want to go down. I want to talk with those Egyptians. Maybe I'll learn more building techniques if I go and visit those Egyptians, I'd like to take a break and go see there. Oh, very, very interesting. And Ham, Ham says, now, Dad, I've heard the Chinese have come up with something called pasta. And if we're going to be on this boat for a long time, we're going to want to have different. I want to go try that pasta. It's, it's, it's new. It's fresh. Let's go. Let's, we're going to try the pasta. And I remember, I remember, I, I imagine Noah looking at, well, Japheth, what do you want to do? And Japheth going, I just want to see Paris. Okay, boys, I tell you what, God definitely believes in rest. He believes in vacations. I, I understand that He's built rest into his, into his law. Of course, we rest on the Sabbath, and there's a time. There's a time for also, a, 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 you know, reorienting, recentering, you know, and, and getting your mind in order. So, yes, there needs to be rest. But I got to tell you, don't take too long. Hasten. Hasten back to the work, boys. Don't neglect the ark, boys. Take your break. Take your vacation. But as soon as possible, hasten. We got to get it done. Hasten back to the work. There are still boards that need to be laid. There's still pitch that needs to be put on the ark. Hasten back to the work. Well, why? Dad, tell us why. What difference does it make if the ark is finished today or 100 years from now? It's going to be here. It's not going anywhere. What difference does it make? What if we don't hasten? What is it going to change? And I can imagine Noah taking his boys and saying, we're going to go on a little field trip. We're going to go to Phoenix Children, and we're going to visit the oncology department. And we're going to see those little bald babies that are hurting and suffering because of sin. That's why we're going to hasten. And then we're going to go to the Veterans Administration Hospital, and we're going to visit those soldiers who've had limbs blown from their bodies and do not have quality of life, and God wants to restore it. How much longer should we make them wait? And then we're going to go to the burn unit, and then we're going to go to the convalescence center, and we're going to see what sin has done to this world. That's why we need to hasten. That's why we need to bring this to an end because God wants to heal and restore and and repair the damage of sin. How much longer should the violence stay? How many more kidnappings? How many more fentanyl overdoses? How many war wars with people sitting in trenches do we need? Hasten, hasten, hasten to the work, boys. Don't delay now, I can imagine also the implication and the idea of, but we get it, but how does this one board, how does this one element really make a difference? And I, I come to the story of Jesus, and I think about the disciples working with the Lord, and they are under the deep conviction that Jesus is the Messiah. He is the Son of God, but they have a misunderstanding. They think that He's a warrior Messiah. They think that He is an earthly king, come to overthrow the Romans, come to establish an earthly kingdom. And I can imagine, we know this from the New Testament, they were continually misunderstanding the work of Jesus. And I can imagine they were uh, uh, confused when Jesus would do the little things. When He would go to the Samaritan, the woman at the well, and they say, well, Jesus, what are you doing with her? We should be in Jerusalem right now. We should be overthrowing Pilate and Herod. We should be uh, challenging Caiaphas and Annas, the high priest. We need to be doing the big things. But Jesus took time out of his day to do the little things. There's a woman here who I can bless. And when the children would come to Jesus, you know that the disciples originally rebuked them. Do you remember from the story? 
He rebuked, the, the disciples rebuked them. The master has no time for you. He's got big things on his list. He's got to get to Jerusalem. His throne needs to be established. Get the children away from here. But Jesus said, are you kidding? This is why I've come. This is my purpose. As he was feeding the 5,000, as he was going to Lazarus' tomb, what are we doing, Jesus? He's dead. He's dead. We need to be doing the big things. We need to be going to Jerusalem. But it was the ministry of Jesus, even to the very least individuals, that painted the character of God in the most vivid of colors. It was the little things. Jesus ministered in communities so small and obscure that even to this day, we're not sure where they are. He would go to these obscure villages, the outskirts. He would find the least. He would do the little things. He would do the little things. Because through those actions, he did, he did many big things too, but through even those little things, lives were changed. And the ark of salvation was made available. The ark today is the church The church is the vessel of salvation that has been established by God as the organization with all of its flaws, with all of its challenges, with all of its problem people. Me, I'm one of those problem people. A few liars out there too. Oh, (laughs) God calls us to work and to hasten to do even the little things in His church. Greeting, helping in VBS, helping with potluck, mowing the lawn. You don't have to be a preacher to millions and thousands to be used of God. You don't have to go to the far-flung fields of the third world and baptize thousands. God desires even the little things. And from those little things, lives are changed. I still remember the names of the very first people who greeted me in the Seventh-day Adventist church, Jim and Naomi Wenzel. still know their names. Very first people to greet us. Gina talks often about how VBS changed her life. And she still remembers the impact of VBS. Every little thing we do matters. It impacts people's lives. And it's part of our service to hasten the coming of Jesus. Again, Peter makes it clear that we are to hasten His coming. We are to expedite and work so that this war can come to a conclusion. And so there's a simple question. Are you hastening? (laughs) Are you hastening? Are you part of the service? Are you actively supporting and building up the work of Jesus Christ in His church? And it can expand beyond that. In your community, through serving the schools, serving your family, of course, But we shouldn't neglect the ark of salvation, which is His body, His bride, the temple of the Holy Spirit, the family of God, the church. Your service to Jesus Christ matters, and it makes His coming all the more quicker. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, it is a solemn thought, a very sober thought, serious even, but also it is significant and powerful, at least to my mind, Lord, that You come into our hearts. You cleanse us of our sins. You put that 
robe of righteousness on us. You lift us up. You make us clean as we have sung. But then you put on the shoes of the gospel. You put those on our feet and you give us a mission and a calling. And we see the example of your son and we see the examples through the scriptures of your people beautifully working together to bring this world to an end. I look forward to a day when I can have a conversation with my daughter that is not inhibited by autism. I look forward to seeing loved ones who've passed away. I want to see an end to the heartache and brokenness in this world that sin has wrought. Lord, help me to know my role and help every person who loves you today to know their role as well. Help us work together. For your name's sake and for your glory, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, everyone, for being here today. I broke a sweat because it's getting warmer. And um, I am also just enjoy having the opportunity to speak with you. So God bless you. Have a wonderful Sabbath. We'll see you next week.